Hello, and welcome to the business behind small business, the show that reminds you that just because you own a business doesn't mean you are a business owner. In each episode, we will discuss common issues small businesses face and offer tips and advice from the perspectives of two business owners, one that is built to sell and one that is built to inherit. We are your hosts, Savannah Stone and Tiffany Kao. There's a lot of business behind small business, so let's get to it. Thank you for joining us for our third part of our three-part series, Hiring Post-COVID. Today, we will discuss onboarding practices and how to create a workplace experience that goes hand-in-hand with that. Has the conversation changed since COVID? And do you expect things to stay the same? If they do, how do you ensure you're the right fit for this new wave of workplace culture? Before we begin, please note our disclaimer. This is available in both our show notes and on our website and should be referred to before and or after this podcast. All right. So whether it's your first employee or your 50th or 100 employee, let's be honest, onboarding can be exhausting and stressful if your employee isn't productive as quickly as you would like or even worse, they leave in less than a year after being hired. After all, as the employers, we are the ones paying the employee from the minute they start. And as a small employer or small business employer, rather, that's a lot of pressure to make sure that we get it right. And so by getting it right, I'm, I'm not even talking about getting your employee to a stage where they can, you know, quote unquote, hit the ground running ASAP. But getting it right means that they can actually integrate into the team, represent the company the way that uh, we want them to represent it and to deliver the work at the level that we expect. Now, all that sounds like common sense, doesn't it? After all, what employer doesn't want that and what employee doesn't know that? But the reality is that only an intentional, ironclad, and consistently applied onboarding process can ensure that we, as the employers, are getting the result that we want and that there is little to no room possible for any misinterpretation by the employee on what to expect and what is expected of them. So um, if up to this point, as the employer, you're somebody who has practiced the approach of sink or swim, in which you basically throw your employee off into the deep end of your business and only keep the survivors, I am willing to bet that your employee turnover rate is probably pretty high. (laughs) (laughs) And if you're lucky enough to not have experienced a high turnover rate, then you're either starting out and maybe just hired one or two employees and you're simply lucky and haven't hit that wall yet, or somebody on your team is kind of filling the gaps for you. And if that is the case, I would advise you to quickly go find who that superstar is and make sure that they never leave your company. So um, on the flip side of that, if you're also somebody who hasn't given your onboarding process a lot of thought, then you are probably practicing the whole sink and swim method just by default. And let me tell you, that method does not work and it is not scalable. Yeah. So listen up carefully to what we're about to discuss, because I think uh, Savannah, you and I are going to give some tips, tricks and um, well, no tricks, just tips. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and advice and maybe in a few methods in there about how you can start building your own onboarding process. So I got some good and bad news for everybody here. The good news is that uh, there is no one way you have to onboard your employees. It's really up to you, the information that you want to include, how you want to present it, what style, and when to do it. Now, the bad news is There is no one way that you have to onboard your employees. (laughs) No pressure. (laughs) No pressure. So just like everything else in your small business, what it feels like is that you have an infinite number of possibilities and that in itself can sound overwhelming. And be overwhelming. Mm, Yes. However, uh, luckily, Savannah and I have gone through the recruiting, hiring rounds and onboarding rounds quite a few times. (laughs) And what is it, the last 10 years? Has it been 10 years? For sure. I mean, I've, sure. I've been in business for 11 years and I feel like I've been around the block so many times. They've named a street after me. 
<laughs> so I think we've kind of hit all of the uh, stumbling blocks that we possibly can. So I am here to say that the good news, uh, well, good news to follow your bad news is that there is a basic structure that you can always fall back on and build from. And in my experience, there's um, the easier approach is to kind of split your process into at least three parts. First part is uh, before your new hire starts. The second part is on the day that your new hire starts. And the third part is what happens after your new hire starts. So let's start from the beginning. Before your new hire starts, this is the perfect time to get all their IT equipment and workstations set up. Well, quote unquote workstation. If you don't have a physical workstation, you know what I mean. Just get the laptops and all the software stuff logged in and uh-huh. signed up. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And um, make sure that before the new hire comes in, you want to communicate to whoever your existing team members are so that they know that somebody is starting on a certain day. Then this is a great time to plan out what your new hire's first day activity is and also the weeks and possibly the month following their start date. You know, it's good to sit there and kind of think ahead and that way you can kind of map it out so that there is a general guideline. Now, I'm not somebody who can sit there and write everything down to the, you know, minute details, but I do uh-huh. find that having a guideline is handy and then you can kind of rearrange it as the new hire progresses after they start. Then the other thing you can do is go ahead and send the onboarding paperwork beforehand so that one, your new hire can fill this out before they start and two, you know, you'll you'll have it ready for them so that even if they show up on their first day, it should already be in their email so that that's something that they can work on. Now, let's move on to your new hire's first day. So this is when they show up. First of all, number one rule, do not be late. Oh my gosh. (laughs) If you're the one that's going to be greeting your new hire, and most likely your new hire, especially if they're a good hire, uh, they sometimes show up as early as half an hour ahead of time. That has happened to me before. I'm gleefully happy to welcome um, people who do that. But um, I will tell you that it is not a good idea for you as the person welcoming your new hire to be late. And on time does not mean like if your meeting is at two o'clock, that doesn't mean that you show up at two o'clock. That means you show up at one forty-five. because if you show up early, you're on time, if you show up on time, you're late. And if you show up after that, just don't bother. <laughs> Uh, Savannah is stuck down her foot about, about this. That. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very passionate about that. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, if your new hire is eager and they do show up really extra early, which uh, because I had an office, I actually had uh, new hires who, you know, are nervous about, you know, getting lost their first day, especially with traffic around here. And they take it upon themselves to show up early. And sometimes they show up like 30 minutes early. That's fine. That doesn't mean you have to show up 30 minutes early, but 15, 10 minutes ahead of time, yeah. like Savannah say, if your meeting's at two o'clock and you show up just walking in at two o'clock, you're a little bit late. So give yourself yeah. some time, show up, you know, be ready and be excited because your new hire's excited for the first day too. And one of the first things to do on a new hire's first day, of course, is to provide your orientation, um, whatever that may be. So it could be like a quick introduction. It could be introduction of yourself or your team. Um, and then giving them a tour if you have a physical office. Um, if you don't have a physical office, um, well, I guess you can't really give them a tour. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can lay out some basics for them, basics for them so that they kind of get a sense of you know what to expect. This is also a great time to communicate to your new hire what your company culture is, what the values are, what are the principles. Um, I also make sure that on the first day, I give them a list of all the key softwares that I know that they need to use. And so I think that might be a little bit more mm-hmm. you know, relevant now these days, <laughs> since there are so many different softwares. And I do also make sure that you know as soon as possible, they're able to kind of test all the login and get all that sorted on the first day. Um, this is a good time to kind of also uh-huh. share with them the first week's agenda. And so that way they have an idea of what they're working on, what kind of training they can expect and what kind of training they need to finish. And, you know, who need, who, who do they need to interact with? There is nothing I feel like is more demoralizing for a new hire who is excited and eager to start with your company and they end up sitting around and doing nothing for a week or two. Now, after your new hire's first day, what you want to do is make sure you set up a formal check-in that will kind of supplement all the informal ones. Ensure that they are connected to all the right people who will manage them and support them so they get acclimated to the new job. And then also have 
um, some kind of external check-in that's kind of built into uh, your program. So let's just say, for example, if your ch um, formal check-in for your new hire is always with your manager, then I would uh, suggest that there's an external check-in, maybe with yourself as the business owner or with um, an HR manager, some kind of third party um, beyond their day to day so that you kind of get access to maybe feedback that they may not be comfortable telling their direct hires mm -hmm. and, the one, and their colleagues that they're interacting with. Okay, so aside from that, um, those kind of three parts, I would say that you can add and modify the process however you would like as long as your activity that you built into the process is hitting certain guidelines, right? So this will give you kind of the flexibility to kind of do whatever you want. But as long as you're, you know, what you're doing is kind of hitting what they call like the six C's of employee onboarding, I would say you're pretty on a pretty good track. So just to be clear, I didn't come up with these six C's. Um, it, is, <laughs> it is actually written by somebody who has a PhD. <laughs> and uh, it's by uh, Dr. Uh, Talia Bauer. And I'll have the you know, uh -huh. I'll have the original article in the show notes below as we normally do it so that you can read the full article yourself. And so just to kind of go over the six C's here for our listeners, number one is compliance. So of course, you want to make sure that you do all the housekeeping stuff that's needed for your new hire to actually legally work for you. <laughs> And also kind of some logistical work, making sure like, you know, they get the IT equipment, all of the equipment they need to get started. And then they have your quote unquote assigned workspace or whatever your virtual workspace is. The second C is clarification. So clarification of the employee's role and expectation, right? I'm sure all the employees read the job description before they got hired. But I think we all know here that there's more to a job than what's actually written on the job description. And there's things that the new hire would need to know in order to be successful at their new job. So clarification is talking about what the employee needs to do, how they do it, rules and policy of your company, things like that. Uh, the number three is confidence. Uh, make sure that your onboarding activity is building up your employee rather than tearing them down. So you can point, mm. uh, so you can kind of make sure you steer their state of mind to a positive direction and help them feel more confident so that they can go forth to do the job at hand with that confidence um, that you hire them to do. Now, number four is connection. You know, make sure you help your employee feel connected to their colleagues so that they feel like they're in a safe environment and that they're, you know, easily going to love what they do because they love the people they work with. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people who may not be thrilled about the actual job they do at hand, but they love their colleagues so much and their teammates that they, they that's the reason why they stay. Yes. So connection is really key. The quicker or the more you can facilitate that so that your new employee kind of feels settled in and connected to all of the people that they work with, the, um, well, the better chance you have at retaining them. Um, number five is culture. So um, certainly teach your new hire about what matters in your company. Um, they should be familiar with your company mission, um, your stories, values, norms, um, whatever you feel like, whatever you built your culture to be, make sure you're showing your new hire what that is. And then the last C is uh, check back. So this is, you know, building in a natural feedback loop so that um, you as the employer, are getting the feedback about how well your onboarding process really is. And that way you can kind of keep tweaking it and keep making it better um, for future new hires. All right. So that's all I got for you, Savannah. All right. Well, I feel like so much starts at the top. And uh, so I believe that before you can hire anyone, you have to make sure that everyone from top to bottom shares the same vision and expectations of the company as you do. Culture fit. It's a two-way street. And to expect your employees to carry the brunt of what your core culture should be is both unattainable and defeats the purpose. Managers, directors, CEOs, and anyone else in a senior position will need training to successfully be a part of engaged teams and a culture that encourages growth. Strengthen your management by sharing with them what your thoughts are on how you believe they should listen, respond, problem solve, and the level of flexibility you expect. As I said, your vision and your priorities for your company should be shared across the board. And I venture to say that if you don't know what your vision is, or if you've lost the vision of your company, or you've never really articulated what your priorities are, write it down. 
can't agree with you more there. You, you probably should spend some time clarifying that because it's not unusual for business owners to get a little bit lost into what their vision is. What they started with may not be what they have today. Oh, yeah. But if you're confused about what it is, <laughs> trust me, I'm sure all your employees are confused about what it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if your company will be taking a hybrid approach, it's even more important that this is conveyed. There are skills that need to be developed in order to find success with a remote team. Interpersonal communication is something I talk about a lot. And for a good reason, you have to make sure that what you say and the intention behind what you say is understood in the way you expect it to be understood. (sighs) that's interpersonal communication in a nutshell. You need to make sure that people are understanding what you're saying. It's kind of like, um, like in that movie, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? It is, it's absolutely, absolutely important that you understand what you're saying as much as the person that you're saying it to. These skills are crucial for the entire team to encompass. So, Now we're going to talk about onboarding practices. Onboarding and training are the very first place your new employee will form an opinion about how this is going to go. So you're making a first impression here. Um, I admit when I was first creating my onboarding process, it was a little discombobulated and disconnected. I'm the first one to admit it. And although I had great intentions, my intentions were difficult to convey via Zoom. (laughs) How it was likely understood was that um, I was Harold uh, and the onboarding was my purple crayon. For any of those who have ever read the book, Harold and the Purple Crayon, if not, in other words, I was making stuff up as I went along. <laughs> I was like, oh, this, this sounds good. Let's, let's talk about this now. Um, that, <laughs> that wasn't the case, but I hadn't taken the time to make sure that my message was clear and that we as a company were on the same page. So it was a little confusing. And for a new hire that's already full of anxiety and stress because of the change, I <laughs> I really wasn't helping the situation. So shout out to the people who were like, what the heck did I just do? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Shout out to all of those who looked at me and scratched their heads and were like, (laughs) I don't know about this lady, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. I had my cringeworthy moments when I first onboarded, not realizing how to do any of this. So, hey. No, not at all. Not at all. And for some of them, I was like, let's go have some coffee or tea together. Are you want to do lunch? I don't know. It was, I learned, I figured it out. <laughs> I learned that starting and onboarding with my story humanized me and it engaged them in listening to where our organization, organization came from, where it was going, and it helped them understand better where they fit in the story. So I kind of started with being a little too human. And then I took all the human out of it. And then I was a little too cold. And then I found a happy medium. And uh, I've consistently been fine tuning the process. And something I added to the process made a huge difference in retention. I essentially copied the onboarding process for clients and reestablished it to fit an um, employee onboarding. Uh, I also began to create what I called collaboration opportunities, but in reality, they were mentorship opportunities for people who have already been working for the company for a long time to partner with someone who had just started. This created a camaraderie and it was the perfect icebreaker as they begin to experience what it's like to work for us. Because we have so many different roles, so only only an accountant's going to understand where an accountant's coming from, and you know HR is only going to understand HR. So, uh, another great addition was to ask, "How was your onboarding experience? What worked? What would you have changed?" Feedback feedback like this is crucial to fine tuning the process, but it also creates a message that if you ever feel uncomfortable about something, or if you have a great idea, we're not only open to it, but we're going to try it out because your opinion matters. Because I don't believe that I have all the answers. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm right about everything, (laughs) but... I'm not. <laughs> I did do some research to see what other companies do to perfect their onboarding practices and the initial workplace experience. Some other ideas are to simplify the process by investing in a holistic learning and development strategy. 
In addition to this, you may want to look into the investment of well-being, support their personal interest, get involved in their side projects or hobbies. If you're looking to be involved in a nonprofit, encourage them to propose charitable organizations you can align yourself with together. Invest in health and retirement benefits or opportunities to help with mental health issues. If your team feels that you are sincere, especially your new hire, you're going to create a long-term workforce and a fantastic onboarding experience. And the last point I want to make is know that this is going to likely take longer than however long your onboarding process used to take, especially if you're like wing it, that takes like what, like a minute. But if you're going to do like a proper onboarding process, um, you're going to have to uh, be invested in in something that's going to be a little longer term, um, like 30 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Not 30 minutes. My onboarding process, the core of it generally takes a week. And then we're in building mode for 90 days, just so that you can kind of envision like what are, what kind of time investment are, you, are we talking about here? If you're working with a remote staff or a hybrid staff, you want to take your time to onboard them with the clearest message and intention. Mm. So... And saying that, uh, let's discuss our own onboarding experiences Mm -hmm. post-COVID. That's a good idea, actually, post-COVID, because people are going to ask me about the first, I don't know, 10 employees I've ever onboarded. (laughs) I I apologize in advance. Uh, It took me a a few times to get it right. Yeah, it took me a few times. Um, So, like... You know, the good thing is like pre or post COVID, I feel like um, it's just it's a difference of whether or not you're kind of doing the onboarding in person and whether or not you're doing remotely. And so one thing yeah. I would say to translate it well, it's kind of like what I said was the check ins. Right. So and just so like our listeners understand, too, you know, it's not the same level of check in for every single type of employee you hire. So like, for example, like the check in I did for my manager or my check in schedule for my manager was different than check-in schedule of like an entry-level entry-level employee. Um, and funny enough, well, <laughs> funny or ironically enough, um, of course, the less experience your employee has with just your company and with working in general usually means that you probably want to have more frequent check-ins with them just to kind of make sure they're kind of headed yes. in the right direction. So like I would at a minimum, mm-hmm. I mean, at, like at a maximum, I guess, for um, entry-level employees would check in um, at least every week. So maybe like every Friday, like a quick 15-minute mm-hmm. check-in just to make sure they're heading in the right direction. Because yep. usually, you know, they would have a manager in, in, in between to kind of do the informal check-ins with. Um, and then for like managerial level um, staff, um, they probably got to check in maybe twice a month and then probably once a month going forward after initial 30 days, right? So kind of what you're saying, Savannah, mm-hmm. it's like, uh, I think you kind of, you're building it, like building it out for like 90 days. Well, you know, there's like, there's, it, it's an ebb and flow, right? Like you're checking in with them. Um, hey, how is everything going? Somebody else is checking in with them. Hey, uh, are you understanding everything? You know, so if you've got buddies involved, if you've got mentors involved, they're not just talking to you. They're talking to a lot yeah. of other people. Um, I personally, I've got, um, I use Google chat or yeah. GChat uh, for different opportunities for them to, to talk to one another, or let's set up a, let's set up a zoom call or something like that so that we have all these opportunities, but it generally takes by the time we're done with you, you totally know what you're doing within 90 days. If after 90 days, you're still confused, then I failed you somewhere. (laughs) I got to figure out where I failed you. Hey, it's kind of a two way street though. Sometimes it is also the employee themselves, because let's admit it, there are going to be duds where you have a great recruiting and hiring process. And then somehow after they get, they get hired, they kind of fall off the map. So (laughs) No matter how great your process is, every once in a while you'll run into that. Um, but you know, certainly, like if, uh, like you said, Savannah, if the, the the employee you have is clearly trying hard and they're putting in all their effort and they're still confused after ninety days, then something is probably wrong with your process. That you need to take a look at. But I'm glad uh-huh. you brought up the buddy thing. I mean, well, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, and sometimes you recognize it much earlier than that. And then you're like, oh, heck, now i got to stick with this for 90 days. Is this going to change? Because in 30 days, you have proven to me that I don't know that I would leave you alone with my cat, let alone my client. (laughs) So, yeah. So one thing I would tell you is um, if you're kind of closely intimate to the onboarding process, um, I think it sounds like me, me, I was, and Savannah, you were too, um, certainly for a long period of time Mm -hmm. in the business uh, you you pick up pretty quickly. It's within a week when I could I could pretty much tell you what percentage it has for this you know new hire to even graduate thirty days with the company. 
Um, so you, you, he can <laughs> yeah. tell the signs pretty quickly, right? So then um, that way you can kind of cut the mm -hmm. bleeding, um, so to say. Uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, pre and post COVID, the one, the other thing that really translates is having a buddy, like assign a new hire, a buddy, a peer yeah. that's at their level. Um, whether or not you have an HR mm -hmm. person or somebody at the manager level or not, um, there is always going to be those little things that this new hire is going to run up against that they don't know how to do. And really, they don't need to be asking you as the owner or one of your employers or even your HR person. Um, uh -huh. So assign an official buddy so then that can help alleviate the pressure of the new hire running around trying to find somebody to ask a question to or feel silly that they're coming to uh -huh. ask you something uh, something really easy like how does the phone work or... <laughs> Yeah. I mean, a lot of times it's process related, right? A lot of times it's either process related or it's something ancillary. It's not necessarily like, um, how do I do categorization? Like I can only speak in bookkeeper terms, <laughs> but like, how do I do a categorization? How do I reconcile an account? I don't know. Well, you know, that's a bigger problem. Yeah. yeah. If and, that's and a lot the of times case. It's because usually it's like, go ahead. Like, where's the break room? When, is, when are breaks? Or can I take a, you know, like something like that. I don't know. Where's the key to the bathroom? Yeah, and sometimes something. it's also just like, you know, nowadays I feel like there's so many new softwares that every company is using that you may just have a software that that particular new hire has never used before in their job career. And, you know, they ran into something silly where they should have X'd out or something like that, right? And that's just not something that that needs to be bought to a certain level um, in the company. And they know that too. So let's just, you know, make it easier for everybody and just assign an official buddy so they know the go-to person mm -hmm. they can ask all their silly questions to. Um the other thing is uh, certainly over communicate instead of under communicate. So, uh, Savannah, you have this mm -hmm. thing about interpersonal mm -hmm. communication. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Interper <laughs> the thing about it is, yeah. and that's the thing like, there's communication and then there's interpersonal communication. So communication is generally a one-way street, right? Like you're you're communicating, you're saying something, but you're not expecting a right. feedback. But an interpersonal communication is that there is now a feedback. You said something to somebody, they understood it in a certain way, and then they they give you an answer or a response based on the way they understood what you just said. You got it. Yep. 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 That is that is key, 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 I feel like with new hires. Because, you know, we all gotta remember, and certainly my feedback loop my new hires made me remember this several times over is the fact that yeah. everybody comes from a different experience and because they come from a different experience what you say it may not land mm -hmm. as the way you intend it right it's not it's not intentional it's not malicious or anything like that it's just the fact that they're mm -hmm. hearing something different than what you mean to say and I'm of the strong belief that, hey, if you're the one who's trying to communicate something to somebody else, it's your responsibility to make sure it lands properly. It lands with mm -hmm. what, you know, what you had intended. So I always tell my new hire this, that, look, the first 30 days, we're getting to know each other. And, you know, during this time, we're going to over communicate instead of under communicate until we all feel the comfortability around each other to mm -hmm. make sure that we're communicating clearly. Um, and that it's flowing both ways the right way. And that's also good, too, because sometimes, like, I feel like new hires, like, if you don't tell them this and you set this up, you risk running into, like, somebody thinking, like, why are you telling me this five times over? <laughs> you know, like, why is there so much communication? You think I'm stupid? And it's like, no, it's just, I, you know, we're, we, we just need a little time to figure this out and see, you know, what level we're all comfortable with and we can make sure that we don't end up accidentally like dropping a client deliverable or, you know, like dropping an important service that somebody else is depending on just because you're getting onboarded because, you know, our clients shouldn't have to suffer for a new, for your, you know, new growth. Absolutely. And I, so I, when I started taking this approach with, um, with my son, I realized that this probably would work really well. I realized that this would probably work really well when I'm onboarding someone too. So what I found with my son, I would say something to him and then he wouldn't understand. He would do something completely different. And I'm like, that's not what I asked for. And he's like, this is what you asked for. I'm like, uh, no, I know I did not. And then I realized that maybe he's just not understanding me appropriately. So I would ask him and then I would say, um, just, just so I can confirm that you understood stood me correctly could you just repeat what I said, what the process was that I just asked you to, you know, do? Um, and then he would repeat it and, and nine times out of 10, it would be not what I said. So 
I would say. <laughs> so that's when I realized, oh, wait a second. I wonder if this is the reason why my onboarding is so clunky. Okay, so now I'm going to start adding this in. So I would go through like our onboarding and, and okay, did you have any questions? I want to make sure that, and you know, of course I would say it to them differently than I would say it to my son in a more professional, less mommy way. But I would say to the new onboard, okay, so here's the first section we're going over the, let's say the standards of procedure uh, manual. I just want to make sure that you're, un you understood this section clearly. Um, do you have any questions about it? No, generally it's a no. All right. I just want to make sure that you understood it appropriately. Would you mind just confirming what you, how you understood this? And then they would do it like a summary right. or a synopsis of what it is that I just said. And then I would go, okay, all right, cool. You understood what I said. Let's move on to the next thing. Yeah, I have to tell you, I find it, it depends on, again, the experience level. But for the most part, it was kind of 50-50. Um, you know, again, it depends how confident the new hire yeah. is. But most of the time, the answer you get from something you're helping instruct or um, say is, mm -hmm, yep, I got it. <laughs> because... For whatever reason, you know, people don't want to, you know, sound like they don't understand things. They don't want to ask questions. They don't, you know, they're so worried about their first impression that it stops them mm -hmm. from having a two-way communication. So I feel like as the employer, if you want to success in your employee, then you just need to kind of accommodate that and find ways to uh, make sure that you are, your interpersonal real uh, communication is working. Mm -hmm. Yup. So, um, and then the one last thing that I, I know from my experience that's always worked is I've always included something in my process to show the new hire the bigger picture. Uh -huh. So something for them to see where they're kind of fit in the whole scheme of things. Um, and this could be as simple as explaining an organizational chart or various teams or, you know, tell, tell the new hire why these teams exist and how they interact with another. Now you should adjust this to, again, to the level like your employee is entering your company. So like, you know, don't, don't overwhelm them with too much information if they're like an entry level employee versus somebody who's on the upper end, like a manager role or a senior role, where it really does help them to understand kind of how the whole thing works and where they are in that whole entire thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's important for them to know where, what cog they are in the wheel. Yeah, I try not to use the word cog, <laughs> but between you and me, yes, essentially, right? But I, th I don't know what other word to use. You got to know where, where you are in the life cycle. Are you the fish? Are you the yeah. ant? Are you the lion? I don't know. <laughs> I'll leave you it at that. I have no idea what's a good cycle. analogy without it sounding like, I don't know, I don't, it's sounding just not, not nice, I guess. No. <laughs> but that's the thing is nobody wants to be a cog in a wheel, yeah, although you right. kind of, everybody is a cog in a wheel, right? Like, I mean, as the as a CEO, you're a cog of a big wheel as as well, right? Everybody has to play their parts. I guess it's just for me. I'm like, oh, this just sounds so harsh. But like I said, oh, I got a better one. I got a better one. Okay, so I don't remember where this is from. So maybe somebody can enlighten me. But there's a a song that that goes somewhere along the lines that that everyone has to play a part from the main character to um to the to the mouse from the king to the mouse everyone plays a part so one cannot do one without the other doing something as well so understanding that you are part of the play if you will the play the 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 success the goal the drive whatever it is you are playing a part you whatever it is big or small is equally as important as the other i like that better <laughs> is that better? Well done. Well done. Oh, shall we move on to famous example? Well, I don't know. I was going to ask if you have anything you wanted to add <laughs> about your onboarding experience. No, no, no. I, I mean, that is something that I do. That is something that I try to convey is that, you know, like everyone is important. It doesn't matter what it is that you do for the company. In, in the whole of the company, everybody's role is equally as important to me because you're providing a service on the on behalf of my company and my company cannot fully function without you providing a service to the client. So if I expect you to act as my deputy, yeah, yeah, or you know, essentially an advocate for the company, then I have to set you up appropriately to be that front facing person because the client's not going to have as much of an association with me as they are going to have with you. So 
I have to make sure that you are set up with all of the right tools and all of the right ways of communicating and all of the right ways uh, of doing what this company um, has set out to do. Uh, otherwise, the client is going to see either the success or the failure of, of what we have to offer. So it's my job to create a culture and a situation in which you feel comfortable to be the best that you can be. Yeah, I agree with you there in the sense that you, you know, your, your client shouldn't have to suffer just because you're onboarding somebody new. Right. And I am now going to dedicate the rest of my day to finding out what the name of that song was because now it's going to drive <laughs> me crazy. Please do. Please let yeah. us know what the name Farewell. of that song is. Yeah. I just know there's a king and a mouse. There's a king and a mouse and it's like a play. It's about a play and it's a playing a part and something about Shakespeare, but I don't know. Anyway. Well, you know what? If any of our listeners know what it is, please feel free to leave a comment. Let me know. Because otherwise this is going to bug Savannah until no end. I won't. Um, I won't be able to move on from it. And she'll just be Googling a king and a mouse. I've seen them. Oh, I'm so yeah. king and mouse. Anything that I can find an association with. Um, but in the meantime, um, in each episode, we like to connect a famous example to our discussion to help you relate our talking points on a more global or well-recognized scale. Sometimes we use exact examples of either famous persons or successful business owners of today or in history. And sometimes we use examples of people who inspire us and have inspired today's discussion. All right. So my famous example, um, luck- I mean, I guess luckily there was actually quite a few, which uh, pleasantly surprised. Right? There, re- there were. There really were. Yeah. 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 So in this one, I kind of picked Square. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just I just did. I kind of like what they had. I thought it would be kind of interesting here. But mm-hmm. uh, at Square, what they did is they kind of really honed in on the importance of like first impressions on new hires. Um, they took note as to what the effects of these first impressions are. And I think because of that, that's the reason why they get a lot of glass door appreciation or um, review appreciation reviews on their glass mm-hmm. door account um, along the lines of something like, you know, the best onboarding experience I've ever had. Hmm. Now, um, their onboarding process is actually divided into three different stages. So each stage kind of focuses on like a unique set of learnings. So their first stage is um, or one of the stages is company, the company. The second stage is the team. And the third stage is in the uh, at the individual level. Hmm. So the and when a new hire kind of starts with the company, they help them kind of learn about the vision of the company and learn the basic procedures to get educated about the products and the service that Square offers. So that's the first stage. And then the second stage, it focuses on the team. So then now the new hire is kind of introduced to the different teams and kind of observes the part that each role plays within the team's ecosystem. It's actually a nice way of, you know, Describing the wheel instead of the cog in the wheel. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much nicer now. Yeah, well. Show them what they where they are in the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third stage of the onboarding focuses on the individual, whereas the manager discusses the details of the role, responsibility, and expectation. So it, it sounds very simple and straightforward, and it is. Um, but you know, again, you know, missing any part of those you know, missing any of those ingredients can really have a negative impact. Uh So clearly you can see that because Square employs and or employs kind of the methodology and approach that it's worked really well for them. Hmm. Well, and I had to do some research on this as well. And I was pleasantly surprised to see so many, so many platforms. Um, So many of the platforms that I use are listed as great examples of companies with excellent onboarding processes. Uh, My favorite system and a platform that I use is Buffer. Uh, Buffer has a company-wide belief of 100% transparency, and this is kind of scary to me, but publishes their profits, costs, and salaries of all employees every year as a way to encourage new employees. Buffer used to have a 45-day onboarding process they saw as a boot camp of sorts. New hires would be onboarded firstly as a contractor, and then after 45 days, they were accepted as employees. But they soon found that this created a lack of involvement and the opposite of a team mentality, so they set out to improve the onboarding process. Buffer now has a five-part onboarding process, which consists of a welcome email, 
basic information collection via a platform tool, introduction email to managers and peers, a presentation of tools that new hires will use, and the communication of the overall expectations for day one. From here, they're connected to three onboarding buddies. In other words, three people that are involved in every onboarding process, a hiring manager, a culture buddy, and a role buddy. If that wasn't enough, all new hires are given access to one central onboarding document to find answers to the most commonly asked questions. This onboarding works. Oh, wow, that's very nice. Yeah, right? Um, this onboarding works because new hires get information in parts rather than being bogged down by all the material at once. Essentially, bites of an elephant, not the whole thing. They receive just the right amount of questions to keep them engaged and excited about their new role and ease them in a supportive, scaled manner. Well, I'm so glad you actually chose that as an example. I completely forgot to discuss that, which is do not throw a whole bunch of information <laughs> at your new hire on the first few days and try to cram it all in. Uh, I, that's definitely one mistake I made because, again, in the beginning, you're doing it yourself, so you only have so much time in the day, yeah. right? But then you also realize that, you know, at some point, like it's it's too much info too quickly and they're not going to do half of it. No one can retain all of that either. Exactly. So if you actually want like quality retention of the information you're providing, like you, you got to space it out. Like you just can't throw it all at them and tell them to go for it or just listen for like eight hours a day for like two days straight or the complete opposite, which is too much of stuff like in writing only yeah, yeah. and not enough interaction to bring what you're writing, what, what's being written to life. Yep. So throwing like a book of policies and procedures at them is not the way to do it either. Yeah. Part of what I do with my onboarding is, is we do a Zoom and we review the standards of procedure manual together and go pay. It's not really a page by page, but like the important parts, the parts that I feel like I you might have to ask me a question about. Those are the parts that we'll go over. And those are the parts where I'm like, I just want to make sure you understood this. Um, how did, how did you hear this? How do you, what do you, what is your opinion on what I just said or what's your perspective? So um, doing that I think has helped because there are some things that might require a little more conversation. And I want to make sure that I'm giving you that opportunity to have a conversation about it now, as opposed to when you're already working with the client and now you're like, uh, uh, what did, what do I do? Uh, I'm not even sure. So, um, in any case, so with each episode, we like to share either books, tools, apps, platforms, or anything we think is a great next step and connector to our discussion. So if you like our subject matter and want to learn more, you'll have a great place to start. So I don't have any uh, books or tools to really recommend, uh, except for the one tool. So I mean, I have a, I have a piece of advice, but uh, speaking of tools, I will say that I used a lot of a um, screen recording software. Mm, uh -huh to kind of, um, you know, kind of automate the onboarding process, right? So a lot of it you can explain. Um, and again, you know, you do a hybrid, you do the in-person, you do the written, you do the video where, you know, you can have like the um, PowerPoint up or whatnot and then like a tiny little, you know, video of you in the corner and that way you can kind of walk through parts of the onboarding without you have to repeat yourself for every new hire. Right. So anyways, so uh, screen recording software, I think I used uh, Screencast-O-Matic. Yeah, yeah, you like use something like that. It software. Yeah, it recently got purchased by another company. I don't know who, but there are yeah. some great screen recording uh, softwares out there. Yeah, they do now. So definitely take a look at one of those. It's, uh, it came in handy quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I had was just really just advice. Uh, one thing um, I just kind of want everybody here to kind of pull in our previous episodes with this one mm -hmm. is my advice is, you know, make sure your hiring process has the same tone and feel as your onboarding process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's just say that your job description and your recruiter um, for the for the length of the re recruiting process um, projects kind of like this feel of like a fun and casual work environment. But then like when the new hire gets in through the door and they're going through your onboarding process, everybody shows up really serious and like button down ties and collared shirts. And so that kind of causes a discrepancy between kind of how what, image or what you know what the uh, new hire is expecting to be very different after they start after they start the job uh -huh. like another example is 
I've seen this happen more than once, uh-huh. which is why I'm chuckling, um, is let's just say your job description projects the feel that you are a very tech forward <laughs> company. And then your new hire starts and then they're being introduced to technology that was uh, created in the last decade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen that. So you aren't doing yourself any favors by putting out all these bell and whistles just so you can attract a good candidate and then not live up to your own promises. Uh There's nothing that ruins a relationship faster than misaligned expectations. Absolutely. And that could be said, I think, for all relationships. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I have a few recommendations. So I'm going to first start with a platform you can consider when recruiting and onboarding. Clear Company uh, assists with critical business operations, streamlining the process of onboarding, uh, performance management, and goal tracking. The paperless onboarding process gives employees an opportunity to a personalized portal or all of their information and documents live for their first day. Uh, Another platform to consider is Click. This is a purpose-built onboarding tool that is easy to use, manages an employee's progress, and it has a nice offboarding feature as well. Lastly, I suggest Lessonly. That's Lesson L-Y. It's an e-learning software to help you train your new employees and give them access to courses and resources you create. There's also intuitive lesson creation, insights to track metrics, and a coaching functionality to give feedback. So I think that's really good for a company that might be highly analytical, or maybe there's some true um, technicality that goes to the job. It's not so, um, it it might be more nuanced than just the straightforward, this is what you were hired you for, and this is what we're going to do. So, so those are the ones that I suggest. And I also agree with you and your advice. Um, It's very important that your message and your image, everything is, is consistent. And if it's not consistent, uh, it all goes back to what I said in the beginning, your, your vision, your mission, your goal. If you don't know what it is, you need to write this stuff down, be friends with the, with the, with the notebook. Um, Please, please join us for our next episode where we will discuss working with a team you don't see. How to build a remote culture? Is it possible? Can you do it effectively? And if so, what is the secret to that success? Please show us your support by following us on your preferred podcast platform, social media, and on YouTube. We'd love for you to also share our episodes. All of our links are posted below. Until next time, mind your business behind your small business.